Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar all about applying idle flow to everyday situations. So thank you everybody for joining us today. My name is David Wright and I'll be your host for today's webinar where we'll be looking certainly at one of my favorite subjects, value and how idle flow, which incorporates guiding principles and the service value system supports the creation or the co-creation of value and how all that can be applied in your organization to promote the focus on value. And to discuss all that today, well, we're delighted to have with us Akshay Anand, ITSM Product Ambassador and Evangelist at Axlos, and Prem Maheswaran, ITSM Evangelist from Manage Engine, who are also today's webinar partner. Thank you, both of you guys, for, for joining us today. And we'll have a chance to sort of listen to an introduction and, um, and speak uh, as we go through this. So thank you for joining us. And I'm sure there'll be plenty of listeners' questions through today's presentation as well. We certainly encourage you to post your questions using the console at any point, and we'll look to answer those questions uh, as many as we can um, at the end of today's webinar. Okay, so brilliant. So first, what we're going to do today then, we're going to hear from um, Akshay. Hello, Akshay. Great to have you with Hello. us today. Thank you for having me. That's great. I'm really looking forward to this, actually. So what we'd like then, actually, if you can just make sure that your um, your slides are ready and uh, we're going to hand over to you if that's OK. Yep, absolutely. You should be able to see a slide which says agenda at the top. Okay, indeed. That's fantastic. Thank you very much. Excellent. Indeed. Thank Excellent. you. So, uh, so what we're going to be doing today is I'm going to be going through uh, the theory, of it, if you will, the guidance that Idol4 uh, has been publishing for the last uh, year and a half. Uh, we're very near the end of the idle for publication um, uh, program um, that, that we announced uh, way back when in, in 2018. So I'm going to be covering some of the um, basic concepts that we've delivered uh, in the idle for guidance uh, before handing off the prem, and we're going to see how uh, Manage Engine can complement the guidance to act or, or bring that guidance to life in your organisations. Now. When we were, uh, 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 you know, conceptualizing this webinar, uh, Prem said, look, why don't we use a real life uh, pain point that all our customers and all, many of our organizations go through, which is employee onboarding and how, how can idle for help solve this problem? So I'm going to be talking about employee onboarding quite a bit, but it's not the only scenario um, or problem statement that we can apply idle for uh, to help solve. Uh, so what we're going to be doing today is have that brief overview of idle for uh, and then talk a little bit about uh, two specific uh, topics. The first is guiding principles, which uh, were new in idle practitioner back in 2016, but are also now part of idle for and how using the guiding principles can help you design a really great uh, employee onboarding uh, system. Um, and then we're going to be talking about some of the other things in idle for that will help you uh, optimize and uh, your, your system and improve the return on investment uh, that your system is providing. So first, um, a, a very brief introduction. My name is Akshay Anand. Uh, I joined Axelos uh, almost four years ago. Uh, I am the ITSM product ambassador. Uh, I've been working in ITSM and in ITIL for about 20 years at this point. Uh, most of the time was as a consultant, as um, a system integrator, doing a lot of uh, tools, uh, development or implementation projects, as well as pure play uh, advisory. Um, and outside of my uh, love of ITSM and ITIL, uh, I'm also uh, a huge comic book uh, nerd, um, as well as a uh, fan of heavy metal. So if any of you have questions about those, more than happy to take those. Um, you can find me on Twitter, and my handle is at Blowboy. So uh, the first model I'd like to show you from ITIL4 is that of the service value system. Uh, this is a systems level representation of the different components in an organization that help that organization uh, co-create value or create value uh, from the opportunities and demands that it senses. So very briefly, we have guiding principles, which I referenced before. These are, um, this is a cultural compass, if you will. It's a, a central philosophy or a culture that uh, influences how, as an organization, uh, we act, we behave, or how we make decisions. Your organization needs governance, uh, which is a way to uh, evaluate, direct, and monitor the performance. 
Another new concept that we've introduced in ITIL 4 is that of the service value chain, which is a, a representation of the work that we do, and practices, which is a representation of the, the resources we need and the uh, specific procedures or processes that we follow in order to um, uh, run that service value stream uh, or in the service value chain. Uh, and I'll be coming to practices in a short bit. And then last but certainly not least, we have continual improvement, which is effectively saying that the whole system, from guiding principles down to practices, everything is subject to continual improvement. Uh, we can't implement some, something and then say static. We've got to continuously look for ways in which we can optimize, improve, tweak, or even completely change uh, what we're doing in response to what's happening internally or externally uh, to our companies. So the service value chain, uh, that central bit of that um, uh, diagram sort of looks like this. It's not an organizational model, it's an operating model. Uh, it's an operating model that describes six uh, archetypal activities or typical activities that any service provider, regardless of size, industry, uh, where in the world that service provider is located, these are six types of activities that the service provider will undertake at some point. So for example, at some point, as a service provider, you will be engaging with external stakeholders. You will be planning your work. You will be uh, buying, obtaining, or building service components. Uh, you will be delivering and support live, live services, uh, and so on. So these are six archetypal or typical activities that any service provider will undertake at some point. On top of this, of this model, we can then map a flow of work, a flow of information uh, from demand to value. So this flow of work is what ITIL4 calls a value stream. It's similar in concept to value streams that you might have come across in Lean or DevOps or uh, other frameworks. In ITIL, we very specifically say that a value stream starts with demand and it ends with value. So you don't have a value stream that sort of ends in between. The value stream ends when value is actually created. Um, so this value, the different steps uh, that you would be taking uh, to move from demand to value. And if you want to read about value streams, uh, there's a great a whole section about it in the Create, Deliver, Support book of ITIL4. Uh, but all these concepts that you're going to hear about today were introduced in ITIL Foundation. But for more detail on value streams, Create, Deliver, Support is a great book. Um, so now that we've discussed value streams, I'll come to it later on, but I still need to do a little bit of uh, uh, world building, if you will. I need to still lay out a few more uh, things. So let's talk about guiding principles. If you remember, it was the top layer of the uh, service value system. And in ITIL 4, we have seven of these guiding principles. Now, a principle, as I said, is, is a way of working. It's a way of making decisions. It's a way of behaving. Um, and we have seven of these. We have uh, focus on value, think and work holistically, collaborate and promote visibility, start where you are, progress iteratively with feedback, optimize and automate, and keep it simple and practical. So regardless of what we're doing, we can always apply these sorts of things. When we're designing a new form uh, for our CAD, let's focus on value, let's keep it simple and practical, and if wherever possible, let's optimize the work that we're doing and let's automate it. Um, if we're trying to provide or stand up a new service desk to support a, a team to support a new product launch, let's focus on value, let's collaborate, let's promote visibility of the, the, of the incidents that are coming in or the requests that are coming in. Let's uh, try to solve them and iteratively uh, build out a, an FAQ or a database that can help uh, other support agents and so on. So the, the guiding principles are, are, are very uh, uh, powerful regardless of where in the organization you sit, regardless of the type of work that you're doing. Uh, and there are four of them that I want to talk about uh, that, that are especially important to this problem, this challenge of employee onboarding. And that's focus on value, collaborate and promote visibility, optimize and automate, and keep it simple and practical. <clears throat> so let's talk about focus on value. To answer this question, uh, to, to, to be able to focus on value, we have to be able to answer the question, what does value mean and for whom? There can often be different groups for whom value means completely different things. So for example, you might have 
different key stakeholders, like the new hire, the new employee, the new employee's manager, the human resources department, payroll department, um, etc. There can be many stakeholders that are being um, impacted by a new employee being onboarded. And they may have different things that they need to be able to do in order to create value for themselves, as well as for the new hire, as well as for the rest of the organization. So it could be uh, setting up a new hire with payroll and benefits. It could be ensuring compliance to HR or information security policies. It could be making sure that the employee has a desk and all the software and hardware they need to actually be productive. So value can mean different things to different people. And it's a very powerful conversation to have to bring everyone together to say, this is what we're trying to do. This is what value means at the end step. But what does value mean as uh, along the way, along that value stream? What else can value mean? If we talk about collaborate and promote visibility, we're essentially asking ourselves a question, how do we share information? How do we sh set expectations internally and externally? So again, uh, who needs to know something? It could be the new hire, you know, when's my stuff going to arrive? It could be the new hire's manager, um, you know, when's my new employee going to be productive? It could be HR, it could be facilities. There could be many different groups in your organization. Um, and they may need to know, you know, the status of requests. So as a manager, I want to know where in the overall flow of things uh, my new hire onboarding has reached. Um, if I'm the facilities department, I might want to have an early sight of the number of employees that are being onboarded so that I can start to plan for desks and um, uh, office furniture and, and that sort of thing. Um, I might need to know what the SLAs are, what, what is the expectation and how much time I have to complete any tasks that are given to me. So different people might need to know different things and they need to know that for different reasons. If we talk about optimize and automate, here our question is, how do we make the process effective and efficient? Now, sometimes it's not about throwing tools at the problem, and Manage Engine is certainly an amazing tool, but oftentimes you need to make sure that your process, your value stream, your procedures are optimized. Um, there's an old acronym from computing, uh, the, the, the 1980s computing era, which was uh, G-I-G-O. I'm not sure if, if uh, everyone's familiar with it, but it essentially stands for garbage in, garbage out. Um, which is to say, if you start with a bad process and you automate it, you're still gonna get bad results. So you need to make sure that the process is effective and then you turn to automation to make it efficient. So here we need to be able to answer questions like, where is the information being generated? Is it being generated by the new hire, the new employee, uh, by filling out certain forms? Is it being filled out by the human resources department? Uh, oh, sorry, is it being generated by the human resources department? So for example, HR is the one that assigns the employee payroll number or the employee ID, which is used by a whole host of other departments. Um, and equally, uh, you know, one question we asked was, where, where is the information being generated? But equally, where is the information being used? Is that information being used by the facilities department to buy office furniture, uh, to assign a desk, to um, ensure that they've updated their sort of capacity plans for the amount of uh, cleaning or um, the, the number of uh, uh, utensils or cups in the, in, in the kitchen cabinet, that sort of thing. Is it being used by the payroll department to set somebody up so that they can get paid? Um, is it being used by your end user computing departments to uh, understand what software somebody needs, what type of phone somebody needs, uh, and so on? Um, and equally, when, when it comes to optimization, it's also useful to ask the question, how much time does it take uh, when uh, a new piece of work enters the queue to the point where the, that, new, that piece of work has been completed and exits to the next stage. Uh, what is the complete wait time? And why, are we, why is that piece of work waiting? Is it because of insufficient capacity? Is it because the team has conflicting priorities? For example, the service desk might be slammed with a, you know, a, a, a flood of incident request, uh, incidents that they have to solve, so obviously, setting up a new user might take a lower priority. So you need to be able to ask yourself, what is the wait time and why do we have this wait time? I mentioned create, deliver support earlier. There's also a really great chapter in, in that which talks about uh, wait times, how to measure it, how to measure throughput, um, how to manage throughput and, and so on. Definitely something to read if you're interested in that. And last but certainly not least is keep it simple and practical. 
And here we need to ask ourselves the question, how do we make the process as intuitive as possible? That is to say, how do we, how do we make it so simple and so practical that anyone who picks up the, the forms, anyone who tries to complete a piece of work is able to do so without referring to uh, additional help guides, FAQs, or, or, see, or you know, turns to the service desk to ask a question? How do we make it as intuitive and as simple as possible? Um, and some of the questions we can ask ourselves here is how much admin uh, is, is required at each step and why? Is it to generate information? Is it to complete certain activities? But how much admin is involved? Uh, equally, how much time is required to complete the admin? Now, we, for example, we might take a day to set up a new computer, but we might need another two hours or let's say four hours for the sake of completeness, um, we might take another four hours to complete all the documentation that's required. So in, in effect, we're taking one and a half days to set up a new computer. Um, so is this process intuitive? Is this as simple as it could be? Um, is there some way in which we can automate the generation of information? Um, equally, and, and as a consultant, I've seen this many times, that a, a data point, let's say an employee ID, is being generated really early on in the process, or in the value stream as we call it, the title four. But the same piece of information is requested multiple times through the whole value stream and has to be entered manually multiple times through the whole value stream. Another example, how many of you have been on the phone, let's say with your bank, where you've got to press a 16 digit account number at the very beginning to be able to access your account and when you say, I want to speak to an agent, what's the first question I ask you? Can you please give me your account number? Why do I have to give him my account number? I just gave it, I just entered it, man. You know? So wh what is driving this admin time? Why are we being asked to, to, to do this admin? So now that I've introduced the guiding principles, one last point I'd like to make. All the guiding principles can apply all the time. It's just some of them might apply more than others, which is why I focused on these four uh, focus on value, collaborate and promote visibility, optimize and automate, and keep it simple and practical. I'm sure if I had to, uh, if I had a, a, a bit of time to think, and maybe another half an hour for our wonderful webinar, I'd be able to find a lot more examples to talk about. Uh, think and work holistically. Start where you are and progress it to do with your feedback. But I'd like to move the conversation on. But just bear in mind that guiding principles, can, all guiding principles, can apply all the time. So. Now let's talk about value streams. Now, as I mentioned earlier, a value stream is a way of uh, connecting the different pieces of work that take place in an organization, which allows the organization to convert, convert demand into value for itself, for its customers, for other stakeholders. So the, a value stream is not meant to be um, a, a waterfall way. Um, so it's not like you can only uh, visit engage once and after that initial engagement, there is no more going back to engage. No, that's not the way it works. As you can see here, the deliver and support activity uh, is uh, encountered twice. Sometimes this might be by different teams. Uh, but in the flow of work, the type of work that we're doing is deliver and support, and that occurs twice. So the value stream can loop back and forth as many times as it needs to. It can repeat different activities as many times as it needs to. This is not a waterfall uh, uh, operating model. But it, it is a visual, a great visual representation of how value is created or of all the steps along the way to creating value. So some of these activities, as I said, might be done by different departments. So in the case of employee onboarding, maybe the demand is coming in from human resources. If I was an IT department, maybe my demand is actually coming in from human resources. If this was my entire organization, maybe the demand is coming in from the new hire or it's coming in from the new hire's manager. Uh, but once we recognize that demand, uh, maybe the first step here is the IT help desk. Along the way, we touch procurement. Along the way, we touch IT operations. There can be many, many different departments that are um, being tasked with employee onboarding. And you can see that value stream mapping is a really great way of understanding what work needs to be done and who's doing that work. So, and as I mentioned, the, the, the service value chain is the central part of this overall thing called the value system, the service value system. So we still have governance, we still have guiding principles, and we have practices. Um, so, oops, sorry, a bit of a lag with the mouse clicks there. 
So practices are essentially the resources. It's the how we do the work. And practices contribute to the service value chain and the value streams. So we might say, for example, um, one of the steps in our employee onboarding is to set up our new hire with uh, his equipment. Now, in order to set up a, a new hire with the equipment, we might call upon such practices as uh, IT asset management for, let's say, the licenses of the software. It might, we might uh, invoke supplier management in order to um, purchase new equipment or, or new software licenses. Uh, we might touch upon information security management so that we know what security policies to apply for that laptop build or that, that, that equipment and so on. So practices are essentially providing the resources, the policies, the documentation, the people, the skills, the procedures uh, that are required to complete the activities that are being described in the service value chain. Now, I'm not, these are all the practices in Idle 4, and I'm not going to go through each and every one of them, uh, but there are 34 of them. A lot of them are the tried and tested um, ITSM ones like instant problem change, etc. But there are a lot of new ones here. There's risk management, there's project management, architecture management, uh, workforce and talent management, and so on. Um, I've written uh, other blog posts, I've produced other webinars that go into a lot more detail about the different practices. So if you're interested in finding out more, certainly pick up the foundation book or um, or if you just use your favorite search engine to search for idle for practices, you'll find a whole wealth of uh, information online about these. But we use the word practice very specifically, not process now. Um, uh, one of the strange things about idle version 3 and the way it was adopted is everyone saw idle version 3 as a process framework and that, that just described the steps required to get from A to B, or A to Z, sorry. Uh, but if you cracked open the books and read the guidance, it actually talked a lot about organizational skills or organizational structures, people skills, the types of tools you might use, um, how partners and suppliers might be able to help with things. And so in Idle 4, we introduced this model, which you see on the right of your screen, which is called the four dimensions model. And this describes the different types of resources that are available to an organization in order to be able to do its work. So we can see that processes are definitely recognized as one of these types of resources, but there's so much more that you need. Just having processes, i.e. documented steps to get from A to Z, isn't enough. You need the right people uh, to do the work. You need the right people to make the decisions. Uh, you need the right information, you need the right tools, and so on. So the four dimensions describes four different types of resources that an organization has in order to be able to do this work. So now that we know that, we know that we can apply this four dimensions model through the practices to understand what are the people needed to be able to uh, drive uh, or complete this value chain, uh, what are the tools we need, what, are the what is the information we need, and so on. Uh, so we're not just focused on process, we're not just focused on procedure, we're providing a more holistic and well-rounded uh, perspective on how we actually generate value. Uh, and each step can call upon multiple practices. So for example, let's say the first step is to uh, engage with the external stakeholder to collect all the relevant information. Well, in order to do that, we might invoke the service desk practice. It's not a function in idle for guides, it's a practice now. So the service desk has people, it has tools, it has processes, etc. So we might call on the service desk practice, we might call on the request management practice, SLM, we might call on the service catalog management practice. There might be different practices at each step of our value stream. Uh, and it doesn't have to be the same practices, you can have different practices dipping in and out. So let's say uh, in my organization I have three value streams. Uh, represented by a sort of light pink, purple, and a, uh, let's say salmon, dark pink. Um, and these different value streams take different shapes, they have different journeys, but they're all things that my organization does to create value for different scenarios. So value stream one might be employee onboarding, value stream two might be user support, uh, value stream three might be um, uh, purchasing new equipment, it could be anything. For each of these, uh, for this example, I've identified what uh, component 
of the service level management practice is required. So SLM1 might be uh, the ability to uh, start an, a, a timer in order to measure how long it takes to do something. SLM5 might be being able to communicate uh, the expectations or the amount of time left. Um, SLM2 might be, I don't know, let's say the ability to negotiate uh, and set expectations. There could be different types of um, capabilities that a practice can provide an organization. Now, I've identified eight different ones, and all of these eight appear in some shape or form across all my value streams. To put it another way, value stream one with these five steps has different requirements. Value stream two has others. Value stream three has the other others. And as you can see, we have some overlaps between one value stream and another. Now, the really cool thing is here uh, is that we can say, right, we need these different service level management to have these different capabilities. So in other words, all we need for service level management is to be able to do these eight things. If you were to crack open a book uh, on, on service level management, if you were to look at a lot of tools, uh, enterprise level tools out of the box, they do so much more. But though that so much more is not required because according to the value streams that you have defined or your organization has defined, you only need to be able to do these eight things. So in a sense, you know when you're searching for a new tool, when you're configuring your new tool, uh, when you're trying to optimize and automate and identify wasted activity, you have this baseline, this minimum viable service level management or minimum viable practice definition that allows you to identify what's not required and start turning features off or to be able to negotiate with your supplier to say, I don't need these sorts of things. It'll help you choose a better tool perhaps. So minimum viable practice is a really powerful technique that uh, allows you to define the minimum set of practice features or practice capabilities that provides value to your organization. And that value can come from different things. It might be, of course, helping your customers, uh, helping them get their jobs done. But it could also be generating information that you can use to uh, assist with uh, continual improvement or problem identification. It could be um, uh, providing you with, uh, with feedback that allows you to um, enhance your, your practice in, in whatever shape or form is required. Uh, so minimum viable is an extremely powerful technique. We've written about it in Idle 4. Uh, we, we talked about it very briefly in foundation, I think, but there's a whole section on it, a subsection on it in Create Deliver Support book. And again, I'd highly encourage you to read that if you want to find out more. But by applying the minimum viable approach, we make sure that across our organization, everybody comes to a common understanding of the work that's required and how they collaborate together to be able to create value. It helps you as an organization to eliminate unnecessary work as well as to optimize tool, uh, the tool configuration as well as optimize the training that your uh, new employees are having to go through. It ultimately, because you're, you're reducing the amount of time to market, you're reducing the wasted effort, you're creating higher customer satisfaction, higher productivity of your staff, and, so, and all that put together leads to a higher return on investment that uh, from, from your ITSM dollars. So before I hand off to Prem, uh, I've got a few key takeaways just to summarize what we've been talking about. Uh, the first is that guiding principles, and there are seven of them, these guiding principles will help different parts of the organization come together and have a shared understanding of how to work, how to make decisions, how to behave, and, and so on. The service managing and practices are very powerful models that will help you document value streams, allowing you to map the flow of work, the flow of information, uh, the flow of value, if you will, from the initial demand all the way through to the end. And last but certainly not least, the minimum viable practice technique that I very briefly described here will allow your organization to optimize its investment into ITSM, whether that's pr uh, documentation, tooling, training, uh, and so on. Put together, ITIL4 provides a very powerful uh, set of tools and techniques and constructs that will help your organization deliver uh, an efficient and effective and uh, 
delightful employee onboarding experience, or certainly any other type of experience. Today, we've been focused on employee onboarding, but the same three techniques can, uh, and, and models and principles can be applied to a whole variety of work that you are doing in, in the day-to-day -day jobs. So without further ado, I'd like to pass this along uh, back to David or, or to Prem, if Prem can take over directly, and we, we'll see how Manage Engine uh, can help bring all this great content to life. Excellent. Excellent. That's really good. I mean, so, so, you know, it's a nice practical example as well of how value, and we'll come on to some of the questions a little bit later, I think, but a nice example of how, how value can be created through through using uh, ITIL 4. So, yeah, that's great. Thank you very much indeed for that, Ash K. Um, and we're now going to ask Prem if he, if he can get his, um, his slides ready. We're now going to see if we can hand over to Prem um, to go through his presentation. Are you there, Prem? Oh, yes. Uh, thank you, David. Uh, no, I can take over. Excellent, thank you, and thank you for joining us as well. So if you can just make sure that your your sort of you know your um, slides are ready to roll, and then we'll we'll pass the presenter over to you. All right, so I'm all set. I'm ready. I think you can see my screen, right? Can indeed. That's great. Thank you, Prem. Wonderful. Uh, hello, everyone. I'm Prem Maheshwaran. I'm a Service Desk Plus product expert. From Manage Engine, and I'm also an ITSM evangelist. So today's discussion, as uh, Akshay explained us, how you can apply IT4 principles uh, to create a great onboarding experience. Now I'm going to show you how you can implement it with Service Desk Plus. How you can create an impressive user onboarding experience on day one, right? Because uh, employee experience, the day one employee experience, is given back to your new candidates in the form of the onboarding experience right so uh, in a job interview a candidate tries to impress the organization uh, and be employable it has to be recipro reciprocated by the organization uh, by creating a great onboarding experience so it's very crucial for us to create a good onboarding experience and that is why we took this particular scenario to explain the idle principles and how it can be applied right okay and uh, uh, before we go into the discussion, I would like to give a, a quick introduction about who we are and what we do. Uh, Manage Engine is the IT infrastructure management software division of Zoho Corporation. We are a bootstrapped, private, and a profitable company with 18 plus years of expertise in engineering IT management solutions. We have got 180,000 customers and more than 2,500 employees globally. We have engineered 90 plus IT management products and free tools and our footprint is in more than 190 countries. Service Desk Plus is Manage Engine's service desk software offering. It's an idle ready service desk software with asset management and enterprise service management capabilities. Service Desk Plus is in the market since 2005, trusted by more than 100,000 customers worldwide. It's available in 37 languages and offered in on-premises and cloud versions. The cloud version is also hosted in our own data centers. All right, let's take a look at a new hire onboarding process. A new hire onboarding request comes with a lot of challenges. It's a logistical nightmare for any organization because uh, in this particular process, you have to involve multiple departments. To onboard a new employee and to induce him into the organization, uh, it takes the human resources, IT, legal, and other business functions to take part and various job roles like stakeholders from different departments has to participate and perform a variety of tasks and that is where you have the first problem as Akshay explained uh, the guiding principle states that we have to integrate the different business functions to produce a combined outcome and when you have a lot of teams that has to work in tandem that has to work in uh, you know concur with the idea it's going to cause a lot of problems so you need to create a common platform for all these business functions to collaborate and uh, create a great value stream okay so uh, let's see how it can be done let's see how this particular challenge has, can be uh, you know solved with service test plus and uh, I, I would also like to talk about few roadblocks that would come in every step uh, when you try to bring all the business functions together and create a great employee experience. First things first, 
the process that you build, the design that you build has to be highly repeatable. Because when you have a lot of employees coming into the organization, uh, the process has to be highly repeatable. It has to be smooth. It has to be, you know, very seamless. And uh, the silo mentality that exists between multiple teams, each and every department has its own uh, microculture, it, its own rules and regulations. It, it operates with a completely different policy. So that is where silos happen. All right, that results in process lapses and inconsistencies, right? So not every department creates a same kind of experience that uh, your employee asks for. IT might be doing well, HR might be doing well, but uh, the principles that are followed by IT and HR might not be the same in your facilities department. So you have to create a common platform. You have to build a, a same kind of experience in all the departments. No efficient processes. Right, so when it comes to onboarding a new employee, it is one of the complex processes. So I have, I have been with Manage Engine for 10 years now. I have implemented service testers in a variety of organizations across the globe. And uh, this is one of the key problems that we want, we want to solve first. And it is one of the complex processes because we have to gather information at various points, various data points. Right, so HR has to contribute some information. The hiring manager has to contribute information. Uh, the IT needs to process this information. So the point at which we collect information uh, to complete this request is more. Right, so when you don't have a very good mechanism to contextually capture the information and process it, uh, it's going to create a lot of confusion. There's going to be a lot of email exchanges, but no outcome produced. Right, and also it gives rise to human errors and uh, multiple technicians, right? So because you have stakeholders from different departments, you have technicians from different departments participating in this activity, right? And also they are spread geographically, right? and that creates lack of clarity in responsibility. We don't know who is responsible for what, and uh, that causes a leakage with tasks. Right. So some of the tasks slips through the process and it's not completed. And finally, when you uh, think that you have completed the onboarding process, a lot of activities are left incomplete. Right. And uh, uh, one more important problem that we have is the lack of automation with the process. Even though you have a very good process, uh, there should be technology to enable the process to be automated and accelerate the onboarding process. Right. It takes weeks for few organizations to complete the onboarding process. When it, that happens, it's not a very good impression uh, you know, that the organization creates on the new hire, right? And there is no mechanism to capture the time that has to be taken uh, to complete each and every task and each and every request. Right? And finally, hiring across multiple locations, right? So when you are a, a multinational company uh, who wants to hire in different locations, you don't have central control over the onboarding process. We, do, we should give the executives a central control to operate the new hire onboarding process uh, from a, a central hub. All right, so for employee onboarding to function smoothly, this is how it has to work. It's a sample layout that I'm going to explain. Hiring manager uh, raises a new hire request. And now this request will be passed on to service desk. And that is where we gather information, the details of the employee, such as uh, the job type, uh, the resource type, whether he's a permanent resource or a contract resource, the type of devices that, that he needs to complete the job, level of access uh, that has to be given to the building and the business applications, right? So we gather a lot of information uh, to be processed by the IT and other teams. Now, once that is done, once the information is captured, then we have to route it to the right department and the resources. Right, for approval as well as to trigger tasks. Uh, when it comes to onboarding a new hire, the IT team has to perform a lot of tasks like creating a new record in the Active Directory, like provisioning mobile devices uh, with a mobile device management solution to enable the employee to bring his own device within the organization with restricted policies and principles. So these are a set of tasks that has to be routed and uh, you know, performed by different teams and different people in the team. Tasks has to be automatically triggered. That is one more important point. 
So there should be a, a set of automation as part of this process that ensures that no task is left unattended. Some tasks can be automatically performed with the help of solutions and technologies. Some tasks require manual intervention. We have to manually do it, right? So when you create an Active Directory record manually, it's prone to errors, right? So there may be different terminologies followed by different technicians, and that is where we need automation to, to step in. So the information that has been gathered by the HR team should be passed into the Active Directory automatically, creating an object in the Active Directory, and that is where you can apply automation to uh, reduce errors, right? And also keep it efficient. SLA mechanisms should be in place to ensure timely resolution, right? So there should be a mechanism to guide the technician to resolve the or fulfill the request on time. And finally, uh, end users should be kept notified throughout the life cycle of uh, the request, right? So maybe the uh, uh, the hiring manager has to be notified on the status of uh, what's happening with the new hire onboarding request. The HR has to be kept updated on wh where the IT stands with provisioning software and hardware. So there should be a smooth communication channel that has to be established between the different stakeholders and uh, you know key people uh, to keep them updated about the status of uh, the progress of the request. And uh, without any further delay, I'm going to show you how you can perform onboarding and create a great experience uh, with the help of Service Desk Plus, for which I'm going to use uh, the enterprise edition of Service Desk Plus Cloud, and it is enterprise service management enabled. So here is where you can see, uh, I have got different instances for different departments. So enterprise service management is implemented in Service Desk Plus that allows all the business functions to exist as an instance in Service Desk Plus. Now, the best practices followed by IT department can be shared with the other departments as well. Uh, all the departments in your, all the business functions in your organization are given the opportunity to uh, exist as an instance and also uh, follow the best practices that are uh, given by ITIL. Okay, so let me quickly take you through the enterprise service management directory to give you an idea about how you create an instance within service test plus that gives the platform for different business functions to partake in this activity so enterprise service management directory is a common resource where you can create different service test instances uh, in many organizations i have seen hr piggybacking on it help desk uh, facilities piggybacking on it service desk they will exist as a resolver group uh, you know, and that will create a lot of confusion. They, they don't have a separate localized environment uh, that can follow its own principles and policies. It will not have a separate administrator and ideally uh, all the tasks, all the administrative tasks has to be done by the IT. So that is where a lot of confusion will pop in. But by creating a localized instance within one product for each and every department solves that problem each and every instance can have its own administrators. Each and every instance can have its own, uh, 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 the environmental variables. So it functions on its own. It is autonomous within the same product. So that is the first advantage that we get with enterprise service management enabled service tests. All right, now let's go back to the enterprise service management portal and that is what your end users will see. Now, in many organizations, a new hair onboarding request will originate from the HR help desk. So let me quickly take you to the HR help desk to show you how it is customized, especially for the HR department. So when we get inside an instance, automatically it will la land in the help desk dashboard. The HR help desk dashboard, this will give the HR executives and the, uh, uh, the senior executives of your organization on uh, what's happening with the HR department? What is the progress and how, many, how, how the efficiency of the HR department is, right? Now, to raise a new request for onboarding a new resource, uh, the, uh, the recruiting manager can use a specific template specially created for onboarding a new employee. And that is where the first challenge comes in, right? Gathering information. Uh, contextually from various departments and various stakeholders. So 
for which a field and form rule which exists in the back end which is an automation which is a, a rule engine that is in the back of the uh, back side of the product will help you achieve it so as soon as i choose the type of the hire i can then show a list of uh, items that has to be filled in list of fields that has to be filled in by the hiring manager i can provide the name of the new hire uh, you know uh, the mobile number and different uh, attributes to process this new hire request and this information can be shared with the other departments as well right once the information is provided by the new hire uh, or the hiring manager now a new request can be created let me quickly show you one such request that is already created uh, for this demonstration right so this is a new hire request so here is where we'll have all the details now from this request which exists in the hr desk i have to initiate two tasks two separate risk requests that has to be triggered to the it and the facilities department as part of this request it has to perform a lot of tasks like provisioning the hardware provisioning the software provisioning access to business applications likewise the facilities department has to provision a workstation right access to uh, the building and all that can be completed by the facilities department right so i can trigger it from within the request this can happen even automatically without any human intervention it can automatically happen in the back end as part of this process right so once i do that a trigger will get executed which is an automation layer and that will automatically create requests in the it and the facilities department now for a technician to switch between the hr and it service desk can go into uh, the portal and switch to the it help desk so the transition from going from one help desk to another it's very smooth since it's the same product which has got different instances so likewise we'll land in the help desk dashboard which shows a lot of information and this dashboard can also be shared with your executives okay so here a new request for onboarding the new hire with the it setup tasks will be created now let me quickly show you how the value stream can be designed within this particular instance and that is where building a life cycle will help you design the stream right so request life cycle is a feature that is there in service test plus that will enable you to achieve this here i have created a separate life cycle for the new hair onboarding request so it is a graphical workflow builder a life cycle builder where you can design what has to happen when uh, it is triggered with a new hair onboarding request so it starts with the open status it will initiate approval the technician can be given the option to initiate approval and once the approval is processed so you can also decide who has to be triggered with the approval which is a dynamic variable so based on the department from where a new hire request originates the department's manager supervisor or the uh, head of the department can be triggered with notifications and uh, the approval can be seeked and also there is a, that exists an automation right uh, here during the process of initiating the approval i can also build automation right i can create custom actions that has to happen sometimes you may have to fetch information from your hrms systems sometimes you may have to fetch information from third party systems or pass the information to third party systems so that is where you can create a custom action which pushes or pulls information from third party systems and within help desks within the instances that exist in service desk plus if you want to fetch information from the hr instance i can do that if you want to fetch or pass information to the facilities desk i can do that right so this gives you the uh, the workflow builder gives you the uh, edge to build automation as part of this process right once you design the process then you can publish it and associate it to a template right 
So that's with the graphical workflow builder. So likewise, workflows for each and every department can be created and all these workflows can be interlinked with each other, creating one smooth stream. So as the request originates from the HR department, it's then passed to the IT and facilities. Once the tasks of the IT and the facilities departments are completed, now it can be passed back into the HR department who further processes it and uh, completes the activity. So as part of this, we can also create a lot of automation. So automatically assigning technicians on request using various models like round robin and load balancing, creating custom actions that has to uh, be invoked in third party applications can be done. You can trigger uh, information flow from this particular system to other systems and within. All of these will allow you to uh, create an automation layer on top of the process that you have already designed. And service level agreements can be designed and associated for even services. Not only incidents get SLAs, even service requests can be assigned with an SLA, which will ensure that the technician completes the tasks on time. Right? So it can be uh, used to guide your technicians to complete the tasks on time and create a very good impression uh, on the new hires in your organization. All right, so with that, uh, I have come to the, uh, at the end of the demonstration. So if you've got any questions, you can feel free to shoot an email to hello at servicedeskplus.com. And uh, I'm going to hand over the control to David. Uh, David, over to you. Thank you, Prem. Thank you very much indeed. I'm just gonna do that, which replicates, hopefully you can see that guys, that replicates um, that email address that you have there as well. So thank you very much indeed. There's a very in-depth, um, uh, very in-depth sort of, you know, uh, sort of couple of slides there about how that activity can be undertaken in, in uh, Manage Engine. Now we've got limited time for question, guys. I was hoping we'd have a little bit more time, but let's just kick off with what we've got. I think there are a number of questions with similar themes here, um, and, and one of them is is really about change and and. And this one's from James, as an industry, oh, sorry, uh, as, a, as an industry, he's interested in how uh, ITIL 4 has been adopted, how quickly it's been adopted and the move from version 3, V3 to ITIL 4, how quickly that's happening. That leads on into another question, actually, about influencing change from Michelle, who said, well, in an operation, in a culture, uh, you know, that, that may be working with V3 and in a siloed culture, how do you, how do you, uh, embrace, consistently embrace things like the guiding principles across different stakeholders, different parts of the organization. Um, so, so this context in all that, and, and how do you make all that work without, and how do you deal with the resistance? There's, there's quite a few questions like that. Now, I don't know if, if Ashke, does that make sense? Does those questions it, make it sense? It does, it does. Yeah? Okay. Thank, thank you, thank you for the, to those who sent those questions in. So the first question, in terms of adoption, we, we, are, we are seeing quite a bit of adoption uh, around the world. Uh, some of it has been shared with us in confidence, of course, but what we're trying to do is to create uh, as many case studies as possible. In fact, mm. one of the earliest case studies that we published was specifically ITIL 4 case study that we published was August of last year. So just about six months after ITIL 4 went live on the Axelos.com website, you will find a case study of how ITIL 4 helped uh, Amadeus. Uh, Amadeus is a company um, which is, I believe, headquartered in Nice, I want to say, in France. Um, but they are the company that runs the systems that all airlines around the world use for, for a lot of operational activity. So it's almost, if you will, a critical piece of global infrastructure. Mm -hmm. um, so the, there's a case study of how the guiding principles and a lot of the other concepts in ITIL 4 helped um, uh, Amadeus improve its operations. Now, as I said, we're, we're continuously looking for more and more case studies. A lot of times people feel like they can't publish it due to uh, privacy or information security reasons, and uh, we try to work with them as much as possible to, to publish it. Anecdotally, I know that there are a number of other organizations uh, in government as well as private sector that have adopted ITIL 4 uh, to, to tremendous amount of success. Mm. Uh, having said that, there are always going to be the early adopters, 
and they're all uh, you know all the way through to the laggards right um, it depends on your organization specific uh, goals um, whether they want to minimize the amount of investment whether they want to maximize the amount of value etc cetera, etc cetera. Um, I said this at a conference last year and I, I think it's worth repeating again the first people in your organization who should be going on an ITIL4 Foundation Plus or any sort of ITIL4 related training should actually be your managers. Because what ITIL4 is encouraging you to do is to change the system. Mm -hmm. And as much as we want to, as uh, you know, people at the coalface, people who are doing the work day in and day out, we have limited capacity to be able to actually change the system. So I, I actually think the first people that you should be looking to send on any sort of ITIL4 coaching or training, et cetera, et cetera, should actually be your managers. There's a lot of re there are a lot of really good coaches and mentors and advisors. Again, I don't want to seem like uh, you know any sort of favoritism, so I don't want to name names. Uh, but if you're looking for some sort of coaching or guidance on how to get started with ITIL4, you know, do get in touch with uh, David or the folks at SDI. Do get in touch with me, uh, and we'll try to point you to some people who we know can uh, should be able to help you. Yeah, that's fair. I think certainly you're obviously right. I think what I've seen, I think, are organizations who have either started to go down that route, because you're right, you know, when you're in operations, when you're spending all your day delivering what you should be delivering, contractual obligations, SLAs, whatever, managing people, managing staff, some of that can can sort of uh, take time to, to to work through people to, to gain some stakeholders and, and to, to gain some momentum in there. Some organizations we've seen have done it quicker than others. And I think some of the organizations... And I, again, one name names, some of the bigger corporates have got the quicker than some of the smaller. And you can see that across public and private sector as well, which is interesting. Because essentially, I, I, I personally see this, you know, as becoming the enterprise language. It's not about IT. If you look at the best, for me, if you look at the best, if you look at the, um, the, the options, opportunity this gives organization in creating guiding principles that everybody uses in common day language across every single part of the organization, it, it sort of starts to de-silo things a little bit. And, and there was another couple of questions in there about tools and saying, yeah, it's great to have, you know, one tool set, but what about organizations with multiple tool sets and, and with lack of maybe integration where there are still silos there? Um, and there was a question there in relation to enterprise service management as well, guys. Maybe you can both throw your hat in this one. Um, and and I, think that's, I think that's where we're seeing organizations move. So adopting this um, this language, common language across the organization, it comes back to user cases as well, because uh, somebody does ask that question. So have we got any examples of uh, where the enterprise has embraced it at, a, at that highest level and driven that through the organization in a positive way and seen positive change from that as well? And, and, and do you need, do you need common tools to do that? Do you need a single set or can you do that without a single common tool set? Uh, Prem, I'm happy to let you take this and then I can chime in with some additional thoughts. All right, yes. Uh, you know, so you can definitely achieve with multiple tools. So that can that can be achieved. But passing off information from one tool to another and also getting seamless communication to happen mm. between the multiple tools is where the problem props in, right? So everyone wants to score a goal, but individually, they never want to win the game. So that is what I have seen in many organizations. Mm -hmm. So every business function, uh, you know, does it differently, and they want to excel. But creating a great experience, you know, uh, doesn't really happen. So that is why we always, uh, you know, recommend a platform like enterprise service management, a one tool platform, right? Not just as a product, but as a strategy to take on uh, service like onboarding a new employee. It can be replicated for many other uh, services that has to uh, involve multiple business functions. So ideally, I would recommend one platform. Okay. Um, so th there was a there was a Polish AT, uh, training 
and again, this was within six months of ITIL4 launching, that they were actually delivering ITIL4 foundation classes to sales professionals. Not sales mm -hmm. professionals of ITSM tool vendors, yeah. but yeah. sales professionals to private and public sector, uh, private sector enterprises, because mm -hmm. stuff like the guiding principles and the, the you know, the value streams of flow, uh, you know, representing how value is created, et cetera, et cetera, uh, was such powerful techniques that could be applied outside of an IT or uh, an ITSM context. So th there have been examples where ITIL4 has been applied in non-IT environments as well. Now, I, I'm not going to speculate about uh, where ITIL4 is headed in the future or uh, if there's a, ever going to, if there's going to be an ITIL5 or an ITIL10 or whatever. Mm -hmm. We're looking to always in, uh, improve ITIL in, in general. But I can tell you the way the world is headed, um, the best way to describe that is a service is a service. It doesn't matter if it's an IT service. It doesn't matter if it's a business service. A service is a service. We have to apply the, the similar principles and techniques and uh, method of uh, uh, um, mental models, whether we're delivering a business service or whether we're delivering an IT service. So mm -hmm. I think that's where the world's headed. And that's why I think, you know, although we now talk about ESM as being separate to ITSM, I think the future is going to be a, a, yeah, a recognition that it's just all service management, but with different terms. Um, the tools question is very interesting. There's a, there's, there's a huge um, battle, I think, that's looming right now between a lot of uh, highly empowered teams in uh, agile communities, etc., uh, who, who talk about be, being uh, enabled uh, or, or have that capability of self-determination. They get to choose what tools they want to use, how they want to use them, and so on. Versus, on the other side, we have enterprise architects, auditors, etc., who sort of say, look, this is the sort of centralized tool in which we want to be able to capture information, audit what's going on, uh, predict what's going to happen, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So I think there's, there's a little bit of a battleground here where organizations have to find that happy medium. Mm -hmm. one, t one approach I've seen to solve this is to allow different teams to use different tools as long as the data can then be shared into a centralized repository or series of repositories that the business, the architects, the problem solvers can then use to be able to distill reports and information and trends and all that sort of stuff. So mm -hmm. that's one technique that I've used. You know, use whatever you want, but make sure the information ultimately ends up here. Mm, interesting, good. Well guys, I, I think we could have gone on there, there are many more questions, right? And maybe if we've got an opportunity to post this, uh, we can take some of those, uh, especially the ones that maybe overlap, uh, and, and get some information back out to the listeners. It's been a pleasure being part of today, guys. Thank you very much indeed. Um, some great stuff, and, and I, I couldn't agree more. If you think of, you know, certainly from a convergence perspective, tools, technology, people management, I mean, it's got to be the way forward if you're just even looking at the, the, the cost implications of, of managing an organization, you know, with consistency across across the whole the whole thing. So thank you very much. That, that pretty much wraps up. We've gone over a little bit, but pretty much wraps up today's. Plenty of great insight that's hopefully given our listeners uh, some food for thought, and hopefully it's created its own value stream as well which would be which would be really cool um it's been a pleasure to be part of today thank you again to our speakers Akshay and prem for joining us uh, for sharing their thoughts thank you. um and thank, thank you, you again to uh, you know manage engine for um uh, uh, sponsoring the today's webinar as well and talking about the tool set and also thank you to emma uh, at sti for managing today's event as well uh, but biggest thank you to the guys you, you the listeners our listeners for joining us today taking the time out from the busy schedules to, to listen and hopefully learn so so thank you very much, guys. Um, it's been great. Uh, we hope to see you again. Good luck and see you soon. Thank you very much. Thank you.